Starting a timer. Okay. I hope this works. Okay, hi. I don't own an audio booth. So there's gonna be seagulls, there's a fridge. We got noise, we got Thinkman. Bear with me. This is an interim update for the 8mm film scanner project. I've had some great responses on YouTube, lots of nice comments, some great discussion, and uh, 100 thumbs up and one thumbs down at the time of making this video on part one. So I'm really happy to have such a great response. I'm really thankful for the community. And I'm really happy to just share my own experience, share my own findings um, while I work on this project. It's been fun, occasionally frustrating, but I've also learned a lot along the way. So yeah, thanks. There's been some great discussion in the comments section and thank you. So I'm going to try to answer some questions that I have answered for and then also bring out a couple of suggestions and tips that people mentioned. Tom Hardwick suggested I look at the frame adjust and this is a little mechanical dial in the projector that lets you move the film. So if I'm clipping the top like I was in part two, I can just use the frame adjust to bring it down. And I think it only works, at least in my projector, while the film is physically moving. So if you are finding alignment issues, just run the film and uh, then adjust the dial. Works great. Someone asked um, about this uh, tripod, the Z type. This is the bottom part here. Which kind is this? And I just, I'll link it or mention it further in the description, but um, I just look for kind of a generic one. And the important thing was that it can support up to you know six pounds. So whatever the rough weight of your camera plus the lens uh, plus the uh, rail slider, take that into account and get something that can hold all of that combined. Um, that's pretty much it, I think, for the for the tripod. The other thing is, you know, this takes a fair bit of manual effort to uh, to get everything kind of lined up, and it's arguably the most like I said, least scientific portion of the process, but once you get things roughly level, and you can use these controls to lock it in, um, it works pretty well. And then the rest is just adjusting, you know, the horizontal um, to bring the camera closer to get your focus. And then ideally, yeah, ideally everything lines up. One thing I should mention too, and I should show probably a separate video for, is I, un I took out the screws from this little, as a plate, you probably can't see it, uh, but that allowed me to flip this mechanism around. So the problem was previously that this whole thing was preventing me from getting, you know, close to the body of the projector. So by turning it around, I'm able to have the camera pointing this way and all this going out the back. And then it allows me to get as close as I need to have focus with this particular lens. So yeah, speaking of lens, uh, somebody said the Lawa lens, what is the best aperture? and the maximum safe zoom. Tom Hardwick brought this up too. He said in his finding, he suggests don't, so this goes from like 2.8 to 16 on the aperture. And he suggested, um, I think he said F4 seems to be a sweet spot. You can go, I was using F8. He said, I thought he saw me using F16. He says, I don't recommend that. Um, consider that lenses at their smallest aperture do have some resolution loss from diffraction. And this goes largely over my head. But what I found was that at 2.8, the depth of field on this is razor thin. So you could just barely move this mechanism and your, the film is going to be like, part of it will be in focus, part will be, will be totally blurry. And so what I did to kind of combat that, having my best shot at having most of the film, in, the film in focus was to use F8 as sort of a compromise. So Tom said, if you, he tested, I think, putting this up to a 4K monitor, and he said, I think um, F4 seems to be the sweet spot, maybe F5.6, but I was using F8 with no obvious downside. Putting it up to a 4K monitor, the idea is that you can see if resolution is being lost. Um, sharpness, you know, across the, uh, across the field. Um, I haven't tested that, but I did test scanning at F4 and I did find myself, maybe because I didn't align it well, some parts of the frame could still be in focus and out of focus. So 
That's why I stuck with FA. Sorry, that was a long one. Uh, but hopefully interesting. The lens itself, I gotta say, this is kind of a funny lens. So I use the zoom and you see this whole thing extends and it's uh, pretty funny looking, fully extended. I use it at, this is two, so 2.5 here on the short end. And then the long end is five to one. And I use it at about three. So set it at three, and then it's a matter of moving close to the projector body um, to get the image. And what Tom has also suggested is he said, I wouldn't go beyond three to one zoom because there's going to be some sort of, again, a possible quality thing uh, beyond three. I don't know about that. I don't have any further uh, insights, but I do think that less magnification is probably better. So whatever you can get away with, I would keep it um, on the lower end. I do believe the more magnification, you might need more light. Don't quote me on that, but with a smaller aperture, you're definitely gonna need more light. So again, balance. So someone asked about film cleaning, uh, wet and dry pads. Maybe you wanna consider turning the film by hand using a film editor sort of mechanism instead of the motorized, you know, going by really fast. And this is a good point. If you have stuff that, you know, family film, something you wanna be really careful with, I do recommend be careful and maybe, yeah, turn it by hand, hold the pad down, maybe have a second one to dry, and do be careful with the amount of IPA, isopropyl alcohol that you're uh, using. You don't wanna have the film winding and still being wet. So do be careful with the amount you use. Someone asked, how does the light and the camera shutter get triggered? This is another whole, I'm gonna to have to document this separately, but initially I thought I would just turn the light on every time I'm gonna take a picture of the LED. And then I thought, no, 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 it's gonna be inconsistent. Uh, and it's flashing and that. The easiest thing, keep the LED light source on the entire time. And then there's no question about it, timing and intensity and brightness. And then the shutter, Timing is a whole other thing, which I'm going to have to show uh, another video of, I think, where with my projector, as the motor's running, there's a fork that comes and it pulls down right, the new frame every time. And I tried to time it so that once the fork comes down and then pulls out of the film, out of the sprocket holes, that's when I want to take the picture. And then this mechanical process, you know, repeats. So on the sort of drive shaft I talked about, there's a little uh, screw and I just used that to put a piece of, um, I think it was like a plastic straw on and then time it so that when this rotate, so the fork comes down and then this thing is here and then it passes the infrared grate gate that I put together. And it's, this is another kind of manual thing, but once you get it you know, locked down, it, it works pretty reliably. Oh, sorry. And then um, as far as taking the picture, so infrared detects, hey, there's something blocking the sensor. Uh, I think in the Arduino, I set it to depress the shutter for about 15 milliseconds. I need to double check that. But the timing, it's it's pretty fast. You, you may need to experiment with your camera, depending on how your uh, remote shutter trigger is set up to see how long does the button need to be effectively depressed for the camera to take one frame and not a bunch of them, a bunch of stills. You also need it to be held down long enough that it just takes one frame and not no frames. What's next? Oh yeah, someone else. So another person commented that they're using a Panasonic Lumix, uh, speaking of different cameras, with a bracketing approach. So instead of shooting raw images, they're just using JPEG, I think. And with the uh, approach of bracketing, if you're not familiar, is you might take one photo at a exposure of say zero, and then you take a second photo with an exposure of plus one, and then a third of minus one. And the way that uh, this person said they're doing this is they're adjusting, uh, I think it was, bear with me, sorry. They're changing the shutter speed. And so by, let's say it's one fifth, one tenth, one fifteenth of a second. And so by keeping the shutter open longer 
or less. That adjusts the amount of light coming in and therefore the exposure not changing ISO, uh, not changing the aperture. And uh, that's important. So that's kind of interesting. So what they end up with is three sort of film strips, if you will, when they're assembling the video. And then for each scene in the movie, they can choose which one seems to be the most appropriate for the given setting. So you might have something indoors, you might have something then outdoors in the next scene. And you can basically just like choose that one uh, time frame or one timeline, sorry, uh, for the given scene. Kind of interesting, but I would counter with, well, you still have JPEGs. And so you don't get the benefit of having the raw process. I think shooting raw allows you to adjust and similarly get that plus minus one if you need it. So notwithstanding, interesting way to approach it. Right, and you don't have to deal with massive files, but you do have to deal with three different exposures and then whatever that does with the camera as well. So more time to, to shoot. Um, oh, uh, tr this fellow Transit to Digital, nice username, um, they said they're building a similar machine but also using a DC motor. And I wanted to call that out as well. Um, using a DC motor is a lot more difficult in terms of sort of your the accuracy of running a machine like this where you want to turn on the motor, run it a certain amount, and then stop it before the next frame goes in. Right. So the reason that I went with a stepper motor uh, was because I wanted to make sure I could have very fine grained control um, if I wanted to stop on a dime. Stepper motor allows you to do that because you can say exactly this many steps, degrees, rotations. Um, yeah, so that was interesting. Someone asked, how do you correct a uh, film that has aged, that's gone uh, red? And so for my limited understanding, film is CMYK, right? So cyan, yellow, magenta, K is black. And it seems like some films over time, they degrade in different ways. And perhaps it's that cyan, yellow, and black drop. And so you're left with magenta, this film that's kind of red. Um, I use a post-processing process, <laughs> which involves Photoshop Lightroom for raw photography. And then I go into DaVinci Resolve to export video and do sort of film video type processing um, with the image sequence. And I've found limited success, but some success with color grading in Lightroom. And Lightroom has introduced a color grading type um, globe or slider type feature recently, which is kind of handy. However, it's tough because you have to guess at, well, what was the film supposed to look like? So I might get into that because I do have a couple of films that have definitely gone red in that way. Uh, somebody says, and I, I feel this one, uh, this is only possible for you. Uh, I know that feeling. Um, I do not possess a mechanical engineering degree. I'm not an electronics engineer. I tried my first year and then switched to computer science. So I do have a computer science degree. It helps to have some software programming background when working with Arduinos and that sort of thing. Um, not to say that I don't think this is impossible, but it, it definitely helps if you have, uh, for this kind of project, some sort of electronics, um, hardware, software, or a DIY tinkering background. One thing that I found that was really helpful for me um, was to break this project down into different separate smaller problems that I felt I could solve uh, confidently. So to give you one example, okay, well, I am not gonna build my own film transport. That's reels and, and moving this stuff through this thing and then somehow getting the frame aligned and exposing light. And I've seen people just take the film gate out of projectors and then make their own reels and do all this stuff. I did not feel comfortable doing that, but I know that a projector already has the mechanical transport. It has the ability to move film from one reel to the other in a very reliable way and a mechanism to you know pull the frame into place. So I'm gonna go with that. And then the second part was, well, are, are other people doing this? Is this possible? I look on YouTube, shows me clearly, yes, there are people who are modifying projectors, 
connecting cameras right up to the lenses, maybe removing the lenses, maybe using their own, um, using different hardware, different cameras. Uh, I've seen Raspberry Pis with Pi cameras. So it seems like this thing was feasible. Um, so the next question for me was, well, how do I drive a projector in kind of slow motion? So there were people doing DC, there were people trying Variax to use the built-in motor and slow it down, but some of those were like catching fire or something. It's not safe. So he said, no, 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 you can't use the stock motor. You can't use the stock bulb. So I went and got a stepper motor and, okay, well, how do you make a stepper motor work? So then that is its own project. So get a stepper motor and then you get an Arduino or similar and learn just how do I make a stepper motor go back and forth, right? And then how do I make it turn? And then how do I make it turn for in one direction for a long time? And so by building these little miniature, you take your large problem, separate it into a smaller project, work on those things piece by piece, and then you start to put those things together. I'm sorry, this is a long winded answer, but I felt it worth going into. By taking this project and breaking it down, I'm able to have these little bits of like accomplishment and progress, set that thing aside, and then go work on another part of the project get that done, set it aside. So I got the motor, you know, I got my lighting, um, got the camera, the camera gear set up. And then by the end, it was just sort of a matter of putting these nice little mini pieces of the project together. So motor worked, then the motor drove the projector. Then I got the lighting and then I put it in the projector and then tying all that stuff together, I've got Arduino, uh, running the running the motor, Arduino running the light, Arduino driving in the infrared gate to be able to sense, okay, you know, now, okay, get the Arduino to control the camera, take a picture, get the Arduino to take a picture through the infrared, right? And putting all these pieces together, it just sort of magically, thankfully worked um, once I assembled all these pieces. So, yeah hasn't broken yet. Uh, and actually, speaking of the Arduino stuff, I said I was going to update the wiring and try to clean it up. You know how um, sometimes you build something and it works and if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And uh, yeah, that's kind of happened. I have not gone back and cleaned up the wiring yet. So uh, hopefully for part three, I'll have somewhere some update on that. Uh, small, that was a short question and a long answer. I apologize. I hope that's useful. I understand the frustration sometimes of like, damn it, you see this really neat thing that someone's built on YouTube or elsewhere and just think, oh man, how am I ever going to do that? I know that feeling. Yeah. But, uh, you know, start small, look online, be willing to chip away at a mountain and you'll be surprised where you get. Um, someone brought up, I forget who, a discussion of shooting video on the camera instead of still images. And I've seen people doing projects with this as well. The trick here, as I understand from folks who've taken it on, is it's important to have a projector that I think has a five, uh, a five blade fan or five blade, whatever that thing is called that spins <laughs> in the projector. So blocking the film gate while uh, the film is running. And so you don't have that sort of, uh, it's the shutter, basically the shutter effect. So there's a difficulty with timing, depending on what system you're on, like North America, NTSC versus PAL, frame rates, 18, 24, 25, 30, right? Um, but people seem to have pretty good results shooting digital video and just filming the projector running at normal speed but it's really important that you line up shutter speed, projector speed, and make sure that your film, uh, what you're filming is effectively uh, flicker free. So the shutter, the film projector shutter plays an important role in how well that's going to work. And there are forums talking about this. This stuff is way out of my wheelhouse. Um, but if you want to get into video, that could be a, probably a project of its own. Yeah. Someone asked a great question about mechanical wear and tear on the camera itself. So every time you're taking a still uh, digital image, your shutter uh, is getting involved. So I'll give you an example. 
This is not uh, what you want to have happen. Right, that's no good. Now, so this is a Canon 5D Mark III. And on this kind of camera, this is a DSLR. There's a mechanical process that happens where the mirror flips around and outside my wheelhouse right now. But there's a lot of mechanical movement just to take a frame. You don't want that. Think of doing this thousands of times for a three minute film and then over and over and over again. Each shutter actuation contributes to the lifespan, degrading the lifespan of your camera. Most of these are rated in the hundreds of thousands, but you don't wanna be, why wear out your camera if you don't have to? Now, again, and this, I'm, I'm not clear on exactly which models can do this, but um, there is a silent, or at least a quieter mode on this camera. You can take pictures, but there's still a mechanical sound, so that's no good. So I don't recommend using a camera um, for this project that has any mechanical motion. You want complete silent. So the Sony a7R 3 here that I'm filming on has a complete silent mode and it is a mirrorless camera. So as far as I'm aware, it's a better route to go use a mirrorless camera and then it's able to take stills without any actual mechanical actuation without any mechanical movement and that is what you want for scanning film because you aren't going to be wearing out your camera's um, shutter or mirror or other mechanical mechanism i do suggest you look at this quite carefully before just setting your camera up that maybe i should make that a big disclaimer on the whole project that's an important one now that said I think for Canon, there's something called CHDK, which is might mean Canon Hack Development Kit. Don't quote me on that. And there's uh, another project kind of related to that called Magic Lantern. Magic Lantern enables, on certain Canon models anyways, uh, raw digital video, which is awesome, but it also has all kinds of other features. And one feature that I've seen, which might be of interest if you have Canon, um, is a basically full silent shutter mode so that you can take a picture and there is no mechanical actuation. So this is important. You really don't want to burn out your camera taking you know, tens of thousands of images over time digitizing video. So far, I've probably done 100,000 frames on this thing and hasn't broken yet. That's not to say that there isn't some sort of wear and tear, and I don't know if it actually counts as an activation or an actuation if you have silent mode on, but this is something I would recommend you research. You don't want to burn out your camera um, or have it mechanically fail just because you've done film digitization. Um, and I would feel bad. So I don't want to feel bad for myself or you. Um, what else was there? You know what? I think that's everything. I'm sure I missed some stuff. This project has been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot of things. It's been challenging. It's been sometimes frustrating, but I've gotten some good results. I've been really happy with what I've learned. It's been quite fun. And it's also, it's also been great just getting folks thumbs up on YouTube, um, comments, suggestions, ideas. This is the kind of internet that I want um, to be able to, to research, to learn, to, to give back, to contribute, and at the end of the day, have some, some nice video as well. So, yeah. I've had a lot of folks looking forward to part three. I'm humbled and honored by the response. I hope, I think it's gonna be good. Uh, I have a lot of stuff to cover, but basically it'll be the workflow in Adobe Lightroom. So once you have all the digital images, bringing them to Lightroom, adjusting, you know, exposure, highlights, shadows, the details, some corrections if you need to do things like a transform to fix if things are misaligned, exporting those images once you've finished with the um, edits. And then the next stage is then bringing those images into video software. I happen to use DaVinci Resolve. There's a free version. 
and then on top of that some processing that you can apply to the video that you're creating from these image stills which in my experience finding with the plugin that I found is a wow it can really uh, make a difference so I'll give you a little taste of that and uh, there's one more thing a friend suggested to me hey you're using this scanner uh, the camera and all that running on its own why don't you tether it to a computer and then you basically have you know unlimited storage and I thought oh that's a good idea so I looked into using in my case I've got the Sony camera and then it's connected to um, my Mac computer I'm running Sony software on the other side and I've actually found some benefits above just using the camera by itself so hopefully that'll be in part three as well if not I might have to put it in part four because man I got, I got a lot of stuff it's gonna be a long one okay thanks again for watching I've had a lot of fun putting this together um, hope it's useful if you're working on stuff yourself uh, please share what you got in the comments I'd, I'd love to see it okay that's all for now see you soon